Salutations, everyone. As always, I'm your host, Jared Taylor from the Biology 112 teaching team here at UBC. Well, this is it. We have finally made it to the end of the series. In this very last video, I am going to introduce you to part of the flip side of metabolism, photophosphorylation. This being the last video means that we have reached our final question. How? How are carbohydrates made? In the previous video, I discussed how cells can use carbohydrates as a source of electrons and energy, and how they convert those electrons and energy into ATP. But this begs the question, where do carbohydrates come from in the first place? When you stop to think about it, carbohydrates, and indeed any nutrient, had to start somewhere. Well, that somewhere is photosynthesis. Almost all nutrients across our planet originated in some form from carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. Nitrogen is also an important ingredient for molecules such as amino acids, but that is a more advanced topic that we don't discuss here in Biology 112. So let's review what we have already discussed. Glucose can be used during aerobic respiration as a source of electrons that can be used to reduce electron carriers such as NAD to form NADH. This occurs during glycolysis, pyruvate processing, and the citric acid cycle. Those electron carriers can then be used as a source of electrons to reduce the electron transport chain and ultimately oxygen to form water. This occurs during oxidative phosphorylation. During all of this, potential energy is released and used to produce ATP. So that is breaking down glucose. But how about producing glucose? Well, the obvious answer would be to simply reverse all of these processes. And to a certain degree, that is what happens. Sort of. Electrons are removed from water and transferred to electron carriers such as NADPH. These electron carriers then provide the electrons necessary to reduce carbon dioxide into glucose. In this sense, the process is indeed running backwards. Also, since energy is released by breaking down glucose, making glucose requires the input of energy. However, it is here where the process takes a bit of a turn rather than simply running respiration backwards. Instead of using ATP, life gets smart and uses a free source of energy in the form of photons from sunlight. This provides enough energy to both increase the potential energy of the electrons so they can move from water to NADPH and have enough left over to make more ATP. This is the process known as photophosphorylation. The ATP made in this stage is then fed into the second stage, known as the Calvin cycle. It is here that the energy and electrons are used to reduce carbon dioxide into glucose and other carbohydrates. Let me just emphasize right now that photophosphorylation and the Calvin cycle are all about inputting energy to build molecules that contain potential energy. Many of these molecules can then be used as food later on by plants and indeed by other organisms. So let's take a quick look at how photophosphorylation works. Much like its oxidative phosphorylation counterpart, photophosphorylation occurs at a membrane. Again, which membrane depends on the organism, but since plants are the main focus here, this occurs at the thylakoid membrane within chloroplasts inside plant cells. Also like oxidative phosphorylation, photophosphorylation uses an electron transport chain. The three primary components we will look at are shown here, photosystem 2, cytochrome B6F, and photosystem 1. There are other components involved in photophosphorylation, but we only need to worry about these three for now. This electron chain has some critical differences to the one used in oxidative phosphorylation. The primary difference is that in terms of the redox reactions, the electron transport chain here is running backwards. What that means is that electrons are removed from water to form oxygen, and those electrons are passed down the chain to eventually form an electron carrier, NADPH. If we compare the starting water molecule to the final NADPH electron carrier, this process represents an overall increase in potential energy for the electrons and the molecules. Or, put another way, the electrons are moving towards molecules with a more negative reduction potential. But how does this happen? The electrons in water molecules have low potential energy, 
So how can they be used to reduce something with a more negative reduction potential? The answer to that question comes in the form of light energy from the sun. In the first step of photophosphorylation, energy from photons is absorbed by photosystem 2, and this energy is used to raise the potential energy of the electrons removed from water. These electrons now flow down the chain towards photosystem 1, releasing energy as they move. This release of energy is used by cytochrome B6F to move protons across the membrane. Once at photosystem 1, the electrons again are boosted in potential by more energy from photons. At this point, they have enough potential energy to reduce NADP plus and form NADPH. By the way, this final redox reaction is carried out by another enzyme that I decided not to show just to keep it simple. I should just mention that because the shape of the electron potential energy change clearly looks like the letter N, we call this the Z scheme. Presumably, whoever discovered the Z scheme did so while laying on their side. Or perhaps Z scheme just sounded better. Anyway, as I said a few moments ago, the electrons leaving photosystem 2 lose potential energy as they move down the chain, and this is used to move protons across the membrane. Protons are also released by the oxidation of water in the very first step. This means that protons are accumulating on one side of the thylakoid membrane and creating, you guessed it, an electrochemical gradient. Just like in oxidative phosphorylation, this gradient is used to produce ATP thanks once again to ATP synthase. The protons flow back across the membrane spontaneously, releasing energy as they go. ATP synthase harnesses this energy and uses it to drive the synthesis of ATP. So, the net result of photophosphorylation is that light energy from the sun is converted into chemical energy in the form of ATP and NADPH. In the final step of photosynthesis, these ATP and NADPH molecules are used during the Calvin cycle to convert carbon dioxide into carbohydrate molecules. ATP provides the energy, and NADPH provides the electrons needed to reduce the carbon atoms. The Calvin cycle is a very complicated process, and while we will talk about it somewhat during Biology 112, you won't see it in much detail until second and third year. And with that, I can now wrap up this video and indeed, this entire video series. I hope you found this intro video on photophosphorylation useful. I would like to finish up by saying thanks for joining me in this video series throughout the semester, and thanks for joining us here in Biology 112. The entire teaching team hopes that you had a great time with us during lecture, and we wish you all the best in your future courses here at UBC.